Basically, I've been doing international business since 1972. First of all, for 20 years in the oil and gas industry as an engineer, and the last 20 years in the franchise sector, taking U.S. brands into other countries. I'll tell you briefly who we are. We act as an outsourced international department to, uh, rest to restaurant, retail, and service fran sector franchises. Uh, we've developed a very good track record. Uh, being an engineer, everything I do has a process to it. And so we've trademarked a number of tools on going global with businesses. Uh, and we have a team, eight, eight people here in the United States and 32 people overseas. Some of our brands that we represent, we represent 16, are Arby's, Build Bear Workshop, Denny's, Lowry's, Massage Heights, Synergy Home Care, and Title Boxing Club. The fastest growing franchise brands in the world today are burger, pizza, and child care. I mean, not child care, senior care. <laughs> so when we look at uh, why franchise brands uh, work around the world, it's because the fact, especially in emerging markets, where there's a brand, there's a known brand like Yum Brands, KFC, Pizza Hut, uh, Denny's, Carl's, Carl's Jr. is in 28 countries now. We're known for, the franchise is known for having a quality product where local products in some of the emerging markets may not be so good. You've heard probably in the last year or so about food quality problems in China. Uh, the Chinese middle class that have discretionary income tend to go to Western brands because they know the food quality is better than the local brands. Convenience, having stores and outlets where they want them. And last but certainly not least is customer service. We might not think we have great customer service in, in this part of the world, but relative to the rest of the world, we have really great customer service. And that's all part of the training program. So franchises that are good have a systematic and reproducible approach to doing business that can produce good margins. And that's why we see lots of growth, especially with bigger brands. What types of franchises do the world want? Well, it's pretty broad. There are, in the United States, there are over 4,000 franchise companies, of which about 1,300 are really well established with good standards. And education, children's, big time around the world. Commercial services used to be business services and printing. Some of that now, but increasingly security services, which is a big need around the world. Um, personal services, fitness of all types. You may have heard of Anytime Fitness, companies like that. There are just thousands of units around the world. Retail, special brands like Build Bear Workshop does extremely well. Almost 400 units around the world in 20 countries. And then last but certainly not least, food. Food was the first type of franchise that was exported and continues to be a huge export market. Uh, burgers, pizza, now, healthy food brands, everybody seems to want, but when you put the healthy menu in the restaurant, they don't order it. <laughs> but at least they've gone to a restaurant where it's there. Like, like Denny's in, in Asia has a, a, a fit fair menu, which is very healthy, but nobody orders it. But they all like the fact that it's there, okay? okay. I'm not sure how well you can see this. This is franchising in the United States from the International Franchise Association. Um, output of franchise units in the United States is about 890 billion a year, U.S. Uh, we're sitting at about 800,000 franchised locations in the United States, and the number of jobs, direct jobs, is about 8.8 .8 million. Indirect jobs take it to 17 million. Mm -hmm. So about 7% of the U.S. economy is based on franchise businesses. You go to Canada, it's a Canadian Franchise Association, we're a member of both of these outlets. Very interesting, and this is in the last year, the growth of sectors. Even though food has been there forever, the fastest growth in franchise units in Canada in the last year is food. It's just people cannot get enough different types of burgers, I guess, or different types of pizza, you know. Um, and another growth is in consumer products. And then home-based franchise businesses. Very interesting look there at, uh, at, at the different types of uh, franchises. There's a franchise for everything. So now, when we're working with companies that are going to Canada, 
we have to warn them about Canada because they all think it's just a suburb of Detroit. <laughs> and I'm not, it's not really a joke, it's sad. Okay. It's, it's sad. Um, first of all, it's multicultural, it has multiple languages. It is one of the safest places in the world to do business and one of the safest from a rule of law standpoint. We're going to come back to the fact that later that the rule of law is not widespread in the world today. Um, we do not presume it's a northern suburb. Presume that business is done differently in, the United, in these major places. The U.S. Department of Commerce says that there are 16 different business culture regions in the United States. Well, there are a lot of different cultural businesses or regions in Canada also, otherwise known as Quebec. Um, punctuality is important for meetings. This is something that we, we, one of the things we do with our brands is we teach them about the cultures of the countries. I'm going to come back to culture in a little while, but Canadians expect you to be there on time. You might say, well, of course. Well, not all countries are that way. Um, now, one of the biggest challenges we have as U.S. franchisors going into Canada in the restaurants is food. With all due respect, Canadians don't want anything to do with American food of any, and beverages of any way, shape, or form. They want it produced in Canada, which is a challenge because of the size of the market. And the tariffs are high and all that sort of thing in this big uh, trans-Pacific trade thing is supposed to do away with that, but we'll see how that works out. So. Basically, the larger brands, which have hundreds of restaurants, uh, in like Denny's in Canada, they all have their own supply of suppliers in Canada. They wouldn't think of trying to bring it across the board because of the administrative hurdles and the tariff hurdles. The first thing we do with a, with a company when we start working for them, no matter how many countries are already in, is figure out where they ought to go next. And that really has something to do with their return on investment that they're going to have in going into those countries. And even though you get a lot of leads from India and Nigeria, that's not necessarily the best place for your brand to go in order to maintain the brand integrity, control of intellectual property, and make money. So we look at rule of law. And the rule of law to a franchise person is, can our brand be protected? And if there's a problem, are we going to be treated properly in the country? And with those two caveats, the answer is about 90% of the time, no. You're not going to be able to win. And in a court case, then you may not be able to protect your intellectual property. <coughs> Neither of those is a challenge in Canada, because it's a country with rule of law. The opposite end of the field is Russia, where there is no rule of law. You're, you know what, out of, out, of, uh, out of luck if anything happens wrong. Country stability, if you're seeing economies and politics in a country going like this from year to year, it's sort of hard to put a plan in place to license your brand and build units over time. Is your intellectual property protected? Are there good trademark laws? If somebody already has your trademark, can you get it back? So I'll throw a question out. Trademarks, of course, are a really difficult thing to hold and maintain. What's the worst country in the world as far as taking U.S. brands before the U.S. brand gets to the country? China. China? Or India. India? One more. Those are not right. <laughs> Canada's close, but not there. Australia. It's why Burger King is called Hungry Jack. It's why Two Men in a Truck Moving Company is called Movers Who Care. It's why Batteries Plus is known as Battery Staff. In Australia, it's first use. So you, somebody coming from uh, from the uh, from there to this country or to Canada, and seeing a brand can go home and start the business using that name and they own it. They don't have to register it. They don't even have to be a company. So, uh, <laughs> quiet. Good GDP growth. The World Bank did a study in the late uh, 2000s, 8, 9, 10, and they found that countries with a growth rate, real GDP growth rate per year of 4%, were seeing a lot of new investment. What we're doing is looking for partners and licensees to make big investments. For a Denny's 10-unit license, you're looking at a $20 million investment in the first few years. So we need to find countries that have good GDP growth. Is the consumer market big enough? India doesn't have 1.3 million consumers for KFC. It has 1.3 million consumers, much, most of which make less than a dollar a day. 
We have to find the consumers and find out how many of them actually have the money to buy the products and services we're selling. And then, running a financial model, can we open enough units and sell enough whatever it is, products and services, to make a good return on the investment the brand makes in getting the business started and training and supporting it. <coughs> this is macro GDP growth. So, if we were using this chart to figure out where to take our brands, we'd say, well, 4% is the dark one, so that would be the Central Africa. Not a particularly good place to go. Uh, and Asia, and it would leave out uh, the Middle East and all of Europe and Latin America. We don't do this. We go and look at, at very closely at countries. So here we have a map where we have looked at about 10 different parameters and sorted on GDP growth, annual GDP growth for the countries, where green are countries that have high GDP growth and are known as good places to franchise. Yellow has good growth. Light red, moderate growth. That means less than 3%. Um, and then light blue, low growth. And then tan, we don't really do business there. Okay. So you can see it's a little bit different. First of all, it's the same in Asia, but it also says there's things to do in Latin America, the Middle East, and even in Europe. So we have to be a lot more specific than those big macro charts, which I call the 30,000 footers, because that doesn't really tell us where to spend money. Here's a very interesting index from the World Bank, the ease of doing business. You probably have heard about this one. There are about three or four ease of doing business ones. This one addresses how easy is it to start a new business. So a franchise that goes into a country and opens outlets, those are new businesses. So how many steps? You know, this is, in the United States and Canada, the steps are less than 10. In, in Brazil, it's 189. Okay. So if you look at how countries rank 1 to 180, uh, you can see that uh, in some of the countries that have high growth rates, it's not that easy to start a business. Brazil is today the world's champion about being difficult to do business in if you're a foreign business. Our countries are in good company there. We're not at the top, but we're not doing too badly. We're doing pretty good. Uh, you can see other countries on the right, which are seen like Chile and Japan, are thought to be very good places to do business, but not so simple to get started. And getting started, being difficult getting started, means money out of pocket till you're getting sales. Culture. Maybe you've heard of Tom Friedman, the New York Times columnist that wrote a book, The World is Flat. Uh, I, I've actually had the opportunity to pay him and uh, to show him that he's forgotten something called culture. Because culture is different. No matter how much everything else gets to be the same, culture is different. Uh, meetings in Brazil, if you schedule a meeting for 9 a.m., they may or may not show up for a while. They'll say it's a traffic, but it could be 10 or 10.30. China and Canada, you better be on time for your meeting. A good Indian friend of mine said, Indians appreciate punctuality, but do not always practice it themselves. Okay, well, that if you're a person that got off the plane, you said, all right, we've got today to get this done, we're going to get the meeting, we're going to get everything done, it ain't going to work in a lot of places, okay? Because to be successful today, you cannot be transactional, you must be relationship-based. And that's really becoming a trend all over the world. So we did an agreement with one of our brands in the Middle East about three years ago where we had the final meeting with the top person in the company that owned 12 brands already, foreign brands. And we were supposed to be sitting down with the CEO of, the, of one of our large trade, publicly traded companies and the agreements had been worked on for months and months and months. But we were supposed to sit there and decide on two, three, three things. And this is a 125 unit agreement. This is huge. And so it was a two hour meeting set aside. Okay? At one hour and 50 minutes, we had finished talking about family and soccer. And then we just signed the agreement. Because the decision was made between the two CEOs about one thing. He said, fine, fine. A lot of us in this part of the world couldn't handle something like that because we're transactional. Uh, direct negotiation is aggressive, not liked, and bargaining is, is common. 
Now, this, these are, I'm going to show you a couple of, as I finish up, I'm going to show you a couple of countries and how they're viewed by people from the outside taking, you, uh, taking brands into the country, okay? Please don't take any offense at any of this mm -hmm. because it's not meant to be that way. Uh, large, detailed finance, franchise regulations, actually, we love that because that means it's a level playing field. When I see that sort of thing in other countries, I actually like it because that means the locals don't have any advantage over foreign companies coming in. Canada's good at that. So you'll find in franchising, there are basically three countries where franchises are uh, open to multiple licenses per country. One is China, size and diversity. One is India, and the other is Canada. And the reason for Canada is that it's so diverse and spread out. That's not a bad thing. Now, this is hard to see. Uh, this is the GDP forecast from The Economist for uh, Europe, okay? Blue countries are 3% or higher. Green countries are 2 to 3%, and the others are not. So what we're seeing here, is there a button on here to push? Uh, Legion or? Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, no, not that one. Not that one, not that one. Okay. So, what we're seeing here is that there's a there's a swath of countries in here that are seeing GDP growth equal to or better than other first world countries in the world. There's a swath in here that are about equal to the U.S. and that includes I don't know here. And then right in here, forget it. There's just nothing going on. But notice Spain. Spain is uh, one of the fastest growing economies in Europe these days. And we are seeing a lot of interest in new brands because big companies are tying up retail space at low cost right now as the economy comes back. Um, interestingly, when I, I lived in the, the Czech Republic in 99 and 2000 running the U.S. franchise brand, and that used to be Eastern Europe, right? Not anymore. It's called Central Europe. <laughs> Eastern Europe is where the bad guys are. Okay. I was just in Poland and everything was Central Europe. I thought that was Germany, but no, because they don't want to be anything to do with that stuff over here, okay? Because they're now Central Europe, okay? That's not a cultural thing, okay? It used to be Eastern. China, okay. Two more, China and India. This number is three years old from McKinsey. It's probably closer to 50 million households now have purchase power parity equivalent of a middle class family in the United States. Um, good for us is that Chinese wages are learning at about 20 to 22 percent increase per year. For us, because we're taking brands into the country that we want to have consumers buy. If you're a manufacturing in China, this is not good at all. In fact, uh, I was talking to one person, and a lot of franchising is moving, or a lot of manufacturing is moving to Vietnam because of wages. About a month ago, the Chinese third quarter or maybe the second quarter, uh, GDP growth came out and it was like 6.9%, first time below seven in decades. And everybody went, woe is us. Remember the macro map at 30,000 square feet? That was 30,000 feet. China is 70% construction and manufacturing, their GDP. We're 70 or more percent consumer. Their consumer base is about 30%, getting a little better. The consumer side was 8.4%. That's huge for us. So you have to look a little detail, more detailed than just the general pictures. And now here we are at India. Um, I like to say that India is not another country, it's another universe. Because it's such a difficult place to do business. But it has great growth. It has a lot of English speaking middle class. Look at Carl's Jr., Burger King, Johnny Rockets, no beef. Very heavily kind of innovative to do that sort of thing, okay? Unlike China, where they've spent over the last 30 years huge amounts on infrastructure, India has not. So sometimes U.S. Western brand, uh, food brands bring in their beef into Bombay, Mumbai, and fly it to Delhi. Because the roads cannot handle refrigerated products. Here's a couple of... Uh, agreement or deals that we've been involved in over the last few years, just kind of give you a broad look. Build-A-Bear Workshop, Mexico and Turkey do not allow Chinese imports. 
the Build-A-Bear Workshops factories are in China. So we had to figure out a way around that, and the way around it was to get the government to agree that they could bring the product in for three years while they built a local factory. Uh, Carl's Jr. started in Vancouver and is now moving nicely across Canada to the east, all with regional licensees. Okay? Um, what's another one? Right at home senior care. Doing well in Canada, doing well also in China and Brazil. Uh, Round Table Pizza, you may know Round Table Pizza, which is a California brand. We took them into Mongolia a year ago. Strange situation because it was a, a Middle Eastern construction company building cities in Mongolia, and they wanted to put U.S. brands in there. Doing very well, but getting the beef into Mongolia that we would allow to be sold on the, and, and the other proteins was a little bit of a challenge. Sport Clips, you know Sport Clips, the men's uh, hair styles, they went into Canada, I think three years ago, over 100 units now. Two men in a truck, about eight years ago went in, still primarily focused around Toronto because the licensee is primarily a regional licensee. And then we, of course, I'm not going to tell you which brand this is, uh, but uh, it was a, a frozen beverage brand that uh, had really big trouble getting the product into Canada. And they're not big enough yet, because they only have a couple of units to, to produce locally and make money. So that's a challenge. And here's the, here's the keys to successful international franchising. 40 years experience, learn the hard way. This actually can fit all businesses. Have a proactive plan. Have a good record of success in your home country. Know what's going on locally and how you fit in. And take your time to find the right partners. Thank you.